So welcome everybody. Um, I'm Matt Weininger, I'm VP for Engagement at Public Agenda. Uh, Brian and Nicole and everybody, if I'm not loud enough, please uh, put in the chat. Actually, Nick Deshikuska already said we are, uh, we're, we need to, to speak directly in the mic. So we're, we're kind of fading in and out a little bit. So um, uh, Public Agenda is a, a nonprofit organization based in New York City. It's been around since 1975. Uh, for all of that time, a focus of the organization has been the relationship between citizens and public institutions. Uh, so uh, part of that focus has been on research, understanding public opinion, how it forms, how it changes, how people come to public judgment. And then another side of, of the organization's work has been how to do better, more productive public engagement to, to strengthen those relationships between citizens and the institutions that, that, uh, that work for them. So what actually is public engagement? <laughs> this is a big, one of the challenges facing the field is that people often don't really clarify what they mean by engagement. Um, and they often are talking past one another. They often have different definitions and they don't really understand one another. So when I had an opportunity to write a book a couple years ago with Tina Nabachi, uh, Tina and I kind of struggled with this and we ended up with this particular um, definition of engagement. It's a very broad one. It, we encompass um, all the different ways in which people circulate information, uh, gather input, uh, discuss and connect, uh, provide choices, public choices, uh, deliberate and major decisions, and also encompasses volunteering and, and public work. So that's a whole lot of things that one can, uh, can cram into public engagement. But essentially, I wanna, what we want to kind of focus on is, is that engagement is about two types of things. One is about the relationship between citizens and the institutions that serve them, governments, uh, school systems, all these different kinds of entities in their lives. But it is also about the relationships among citizens themselves. And, and that's, one, that's the side that often gets lost um, when you're talking about engagement. And, and both of these sides are significant. They have different uh, benefits and values that you need to, to be keeping track of. There's also, of course, ways to take, take action, take civic action without engagement. Uh, this is a picture, I think, from the Ukraine. Uh, and this is the, the face of a local official which has been painted around a pothole to encourage the official local government to, to fill the pothole. So there's many ways of, of, of getting things done, uh, but we're kind of in this webinar and in our work, we're kind of focusing generally on the ways that this can be done in partnership between citizens and institutions. So why does engagement matter? I mean, engagement matters more than ever now, first of all, because of changes in citizen capacities and expectations, which mean that kind of older forms, more, more conventional forms of governance are not no longer working as well. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why that is. And then the other reason why engagement matters is that community health in many ways depends on social capital and social networks. So, the, so that other side of engagement, the, the, the status, the strength of the relationships among citizens between different groups of people um, has an impact on, on all kinds of things in the community. So let me, um, uh, ask then uh, for if you can use your chat function um, to uh, to answer this uh, couple questions for us. Um, this is the audience participation part of the webinar. Who can tell us uh, in in the chat? You know what are the top three risk factors for serious illness and premature death? And I see. Yeah. Smoking. Smoking is one of the top three. Alcohol. Uh, loneliness. Yeah, sorry. So here we go. Um, I will click the thing here. Oops. There we go. Obesity is number three. I'm not sure everybody an answer, uh, gave that one. Number two, smoking. And number one, loneliness. Basically, social isolation is a more significant factor in terms of people's uh, physical health and, and, and serious illness, premature death than any of these other factors. So engagement in that sense, a very basic sense, are people connected to one another? Are they supporting one another? That level of engagement has a tremendous quantifiable effect on things like physical health. Uh, so this is the next, uh, so okay, this slide's already uh, filled in here, but so another, another kind of overarching kind of reason uh, why engagement matters is, has to do with K-12 uh, student success. And so, and I'm sure many of you know this already, we don't really even need to quiz you on it, that one of the most enduring findings when it comes to K-12 research is that the extent to which parents and other family members and other adults are actually involved in the life of, of, of the kid, that that extent really kind of, um, 
correlate with the, the success of the kid in terms of all the different ways you could measure that, whether it's test scores or dropout rates or, or um, disciplinary problems or anything, things like that. And then finally, um, another, well, not finally, um, anyone can actually chime in on this one as well. What produced these kinds of impacts in Brazilian cities? Uh, lower corruption, lower inequality, infant mortality, higher trust in government, higher tax compliance, uh, officials more likely to be reelected. And again, you can, can um, kind of chime in by chat here. Let's see who has answered. Oh, there we go. Anybody want to answer this one? Oh, yep, okay. <laughs> I have no idea who's going to answer. <laughs> Neighborhood groups probably is, but several people have already answered uh, participatory budgeting or PB. And it's important to point out that, that you know, what we're talking about here is P the experience of PB in Brazil, which of course has been going on, well not of course, but as you may know, has been going on for uh, close to three decades now. Started in, in uh, one city or several cities in Brazil in 1989, has spread to many other cities. So this is a long-term effect and I suspect it has as much to do with the social networks and social capitals as, the, as, as the, that have been built through this kind of long-term intensive broad-based process as it does on any particular policy decision reached the process. So then the final, final kind of little audience participation thing we'll do here is, is um, what, you know, if, if you're thinking about the, the decisions that are made um, in cities, in towns on a regular basis, uh, a lot of those have to do with issues of land use, housing, public transit, um, whether there can be a mix of residential, business um, uses and neighborhoods. Lots of times you have local officials and other kinds of entities trying to kind of to push some of these kinds of things so they see them as beneficial to the community and oftentimes there is a pushback. Um, so, so would anyone want to kind of chime in on this and kind of name what we're talking about here? This is the last one. Mm. Funding and funding. All right, I'll just, in the interest of time, tell you that, that you know, the thing that often people are dealing with is what was sometimes called not in my backyard or NIMBY. And then of course, NIMBY can often be a good thing. It depends on your perspective and what, what the issue is. Um, and so I don't wanna, I don't mean to kind of take sides in, in, in the debate about all kinds of development decisions, but I guess what I will point out here is this lack of engagement, the, the lack of kind of productive engagement is, is what is inhibiting communities from making decisions in a way that people are happy with, that officials are happy with, that, that, um, that reflects uh, what the data suggests. And so that this kind of way in which we make development decisions is, is often uh, pretty badly done in most communities. Some other impact, some other reasons why engagement seems to matter. One has to do with economic development, uh, where you see higher levels of community attachment. Uh, you, you see, tend to see higher rates of economic growth and vitality. Uh, when, you, when you're looking at crime and public safety, uh, neighborhoods with a higher rate of collective efficacy, meaning people in those neighborhoods feel uh, they can do something about the, the problems and, and, and opportunities facing their neighborhoods. In most places, crime is lower. And then also there are certainly some impacts that, that are, are related to evaluations of particular processes. And, and when you have a kind of a, a well done engagement process, a lot of these evaluations suggest that people are more likely to learn, often change their minds, they're more likely to vote, volunteer, run for office, have higher trust in government, they're more likely to pay their taxes, all those kinds of things. So, you know, when I started this work 20 years ago, I had a sense, I think, of the kind of the small picture of how, how do you how do you kind of facilitate productive meetings? How do you um, frame issues? Some of the skills we're gonna talk about. I, I didn't have a sense of the big picture until maybe halfway through uh, you know, my career when I was in a, a meeting room uh, in um, Lakewood, Colorado. And basically what was happening in Lakewood was that uh, the mayor had brought together a whole bunch of people, community leaders, neighborhood groups, and, and he was bringing them together over the, the fact that the city budget had fallen pretty deeply into the red. Uh, basically, uh, people in, in surveys said that Lake was a, Lakewood was a wonderful place to live. They, they thought the schools were good. They liked parks, all those kinds of things. And yet nine times in the previous 30 years, people had voted down sales tax increases meant to merely maintain the same level of public services. So the mayor's brought together people at this meeting and saying, well, you know, what do you want me to do? If I um, try to raise taxes again, people will be unhappy about that. If I cut services, they're unhappy about that as well. 
what do you want me to do? And so finally, somebody in the back of the room said, you know, Mayor, we think you work hard for us, but what we have here is a parent-child relationship between government and citizens. And what we need to create is more of an adult-adult relationship. And that was a nice image. It was something that I realized I was seeing in lots of other places as well, that, that in all kinds of places, um, people are busier than ever. They have less time to get involved in anything or get engaged in anything. And yet, they, when they do get engaged, they bring more skills, capacity uh, to the table. Um, then in many ways, people are feeling more entitled to the protection and services of, of the institutions in their lives, and yet they are, feel less confident that those institutions will be able to deliver. And then also people in many ways, despite all the ways we have to get informed these days, in many ways people are less informed of what was happening in their neighborhood or, or the school their kids attend. And yet when they find an issue or a cause or something that they care about, they're better able to find the information, the allies, the resources they need to make an impact on that issue. So you could essentially say that people are, 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 more, are, are better at governing and less willing to be governed than ever before. So in, to kind of zero in on several of these kind of changes in the relationship, um, first of all, you've got young families, you know, parents with young children, and in many ways they have the most at stake in community success um, and more motivation to engage in some ways, but even less time than others. And when you look at the, what they are engaging in, what, what you often see is that they're engaging in, in community, they're not just politics. Then also changes in the relationships in terms of diversity, whether it's recent immigration or simply you know, kinds of uh, racial and ethnic diversity in community. There's clearly a set of incentives here, a set of reasons why engagement matters um, and why engagement is changing. Uh, you see a need for citizens to engage one another, uh, an interest in, in mobilizing to address various kinds of inequalities, and an interest in trying to reap the benefits, the many benefits of, of diversity, all, of, all, all various kinds of diversity you can have. So another shift that to, to kind of to note here is, is just the changes in how we think about community. I mean, obviously, this is the map everyone uh, is used to, or most people are used to. Most of us grew up with this map. It's a map of geographic jurisdiction. And of course, how decisions are made, how public resources are allocated, how governance works is tied to geography. You're living in a place which is part of a bigger place, which is part of a bigger place. And of course, all of that is still true. We still all have all of those systems of governance and community, and we also have this. Um, and if you ever have a chance to look at this map up close, it's uh, pretty funny. Uh, lots of jokes are embedded in it. But basically, the map is making the point that the community is now, of course, a virtual and online as well as, 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 as geographic. And so essentially, the, the same principles are there when it comes to engagement in terms of reaching out to people and bringing them to the table. Uh, you're still trying to kind of work through networks and figuring out who knows who and how you can get people to, to come to get involved in things, but you're having to do this on two different dimensions. See, there's the, the geographic dimension and then also this virtual dimension where you're trying to reach out, find networks of people and figure out what, what they care about and how they can get invited to the table. We've got all these changes um, that create new opportunities and lots of new challenges. And meanwhile, what we have in most cases, most of the time is still very conventional uh, source of engagement. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Cincinnati, the Cincinnati City, City Council, after they have uh, voted to both raise taxes and cut services. <laughs> so they're not looking very happy. Um, basically, the points, you know, a few things out about this picture, um, you know, you, what you've got is kind of the parent-child dynamic, you know, even in the way in which the room is laid out. You've got the, the city council members up on a dais behind a, a, a big desk. They have, each have microphones um, and name tags. And then you've got the, the citizens, you know, in this case, the, the children of the analogy who have uncomfortable chairs, one microphone um, and uh, no name tags. So even the layout of the room kind of, you know, embodies this kind of parent-child dynamic and governance and makes people angry. What they have in most cases is, you know, a chance to kind of go to the microphone for three minutes at a time and ask questions or make statements. And often that really they're venting to their public officials, which is why they look unhappy in that picture, I think. Um, and, you know, this is a this is a whole format for engagement, which is very it's, it's you know, mid 20th century. It was enacted as part of a kind of a mid 20th century vision of how you achieve transparency. It doesn't really fit with the ways we can achieve transparency today. So it's in some, even in that sense, it's out of step with, with times. But basically it is something that 
is oriented to getting comments on the, comments on the record. It is easy to disrupt, um, and it's, it does not it kind of give people a chance to feel like they've been heard. So let's stop there for a second. And if you see the Q and A um, tab here, whoop. Uh, so we're open. We'll, we'll take a few questions here before we uh, move on to the next uh, section of things. Nicole's going to take over. So, so the first question is a two-parter. Do you have thoughts on how to reconcile public participation participation by the internet and a twenty-four-seven uh, continuing discussion, including public body members, and two open meeting laws, sometimes called sunshine laws, which prohibit members of a public body from participating in a discussion in venues other than an announced physical, in-person physical meeting. So yes, this is a uh, this is a challenge which comes up almost everywhere. Um, <laughs> and and a couple of things to say about this. And, and Nicole, if you want to chime in on this uh, as well, please do. But basically, you know, there's a couple of things to say. One is that that um, uh, there's a challenge when, when it comes to a meeting loss in the sense that the people who know the laws don't know engagement that well, in my experience, and the people who know engagement uh, don't necessarily know the law. So, so part of the problem is sometimes interpretation. And so if you examine you know, the, the, the laws in your state, you'll often find that they allow for, for more productive types of conversation than you, than you expect. The other thing is that you can actually change those laws, and some some cities have done that. Um, we I was part of an effort to create a model ordinance on public engagement uh, several years ago, uh, which then has been used by several cities to update their their own kind of, um, processes and their own uh, local ordinances for how they do open meetings. So that's possible as well. Um, Another kind of uh, rule of thumb generally is that you know you have to be careful about um, you have to be careful about uh, uh, separating the process of discussing policy changes and the, the actual way the, the vote or the actual decision. And so, if you sometimes what you can do in order to remain compliant with the laws is you make sure that those two things are very clearly separated, whether this is happening online or face to face. Then you've kind of satisfied what you need to do as far as the law. Any other questions people want to um, uh, interject with here? And folks, this is a reminder, there's the Q&A button uh, on your uh, Zoom uh, webinar uh, app. If you want to ask a question, just go ahead and click that and type it in there. Um, you'll also have an opportunity to ask more questions later in the webinar as well. Oh, and one other thing to say about this first question is that, um, just to give you a, a sample, um, Several different cities around the country, one of them is Yuma, Arizona, and others, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, have actually um, created kind of an opportunity at the very beginning of city council uh, meetings for people to actually take part in a small group deliberative dis discussion with staff um, and officials. And this is something that they're doing. It's compliant with their state laws. And it's also giving people a chance to really uh, learn more about issues, ask questions, uh, understand some of the choices facing the electeds and the staff and have a much better conversation overall. So let's, why don't we move on here? And I think Nicole, this is now, um, I think we're share, we're switching the screen back to you guys. There we go. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you, Matt. Um, so Matt kind of gave an overview of some more conventional forms of engagement. I wanna do a little bit of a deeper dive in two other forms of engagement that that we've encountered that we do in our work here at Public Agenda. So the first one is thick engagement. So when you think about thick engagement, think about engagement that's form, that's deliberative, emotional, um, that has um, a number of choices that groups can make. Um, and then there's thin engagement. And for thin engagement, we like to think of engagement that's fast, easy, also full of choices, but for individuals. So when you think of thick engagement, you think of empowering the group, and when we think of thin engagement, we think of empowering the individual. Sorry. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so some examples of thick engagement processes, um, and I'm sure many of you have seen these in your work or use these processes. So think of small groups. Um, usually there are no more than 12 people. You usually have a facilitator that's trained, that's neutral. Um, and you, what's really important about small group processes is really starting with opportunities for folks to share their, their experience, for them to really um, see where, where other people in their group are coming from. Um, there's opportunities oftentimes to lay out options 
and a plan for action. So when they leave, they're not sort of just leaving the process at the table, that there's, there's some work to be done after. Um, and these processes have been around for a while, but they have really evolved in part through engagement efforts um, that happened um, in, the, in the 90s, really in response to um, um, work around um, race and difference. Another um, way of thinking about thick engagement um, is a tool that is used to frame an issue. So um, oftentimes these could be discussion guides. They give people um, information, oftentimes um, factual, nonpartisan information that they can use. Um, and then they lay out several options their views for, for, for participants to grapple with. Um, there usually um, are no um, sort of right or wrong answers with, with the approaches. So it gives people an opportunity to decide which one works for them. And if there's an approach that doesn't work for them, they can kind of work together and find one that, that works well. Um, really what's important about this approach is to, to really um, show that there are gray areas with decision making. Um, and then the other thing that's really important about framing the issue, especially if it's around a decision, is there needs to be a certain amount of trust with the participants that they'll make a good decision in terms of the approach that they choose. Um, and then another form of thick engagement encourages civic action. So this really capitalizes on the creativity and the input and the energy of participants. So we like to use this example. This is um, in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle. Um, the neighborhood was grappling with um, an issue um, under this underpass of a bridge. Um, there was um, some loitering, drug dealing. It really was an area that wasn't safe for the residents. The residents identified it wasn't safe. So local arts council opened up to the, the community to come up with a creative um, resolution to this process. And they built a troll. <laughs> um, and what I love about this example is most likely the city council or other leaders wouldn't have decided to do this um, as, a, as a way to resolve this issue, but it really builds on the trust of the community um, to be creative. Uh, and what's awesome about this is they came up with the idea, some local artists designed it, and the community donated time and materials. Um, this is actually a, a picture that I took. And um, it's a tourist. I actually had to wait in line to take this picture. It's become a tourist attraction. So it has sort of spillover effects that are generally um, positive for the, for the community. Um, here's some other examples. There's many different examples of thick engagement. Um, here's just sort of a spattering of them. Um, we already touched um, upon participatory budgeting, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But you have study circles, National Issues Forum, World Cafe. Um, there's a number of um, online and face-to-face -face processes that could, could um, encompass thick engagement. Now, thin engagement. Some examples of thin engagement could be apps, could be um, a petition that you sign, a poll, both online and in person, surveys, hotlines, mapping exercises, and even the local booth at your, your county fair or festival. Um, thin engagement can in include um, opportunities to affiliate with a cause, to rank ideas, donate money. And I wanted to highlight this because I did notice that uh, Rachel Baker had asked, uh, could donating money be a form of engagement? And yes, we, we absolutely agree that donating money is a form of engagement. Um, playing games is also um, a form of thin engagement as well as providing data. So here's some quick examples of thin engagement. So opportunities for regular folks to gather data um, and in terms of um, an online platform, um, this could take the form of a platform called C Click Fix. Um, this is done all over the world. This one is an example um, of a platform in New York City where local um, cyclists can identify different issues in the community and um, actually use uh, GPS mapping, map the community, map the issue, pardon me, and that information is transmitted to local, to people who can make decisions. So in this case, um, could be the Parks Department. Um, there's also um, websites that or apps that allow you to identify potholes in your community and rank which ones are most important for the city to fix. Um, there are also applications that allow people to generate and rank ideas. So this is sort of an example of an of a online um, sticky wall. So you have um, residents that, um, in this case in Phoenix, 
um, that are able to generate ideas on what, what they want to do in terms of improving their community. And then through the online platform, you can actually rank which ones. Um, and then the, the city chose the ones that, that were, were most popular to, to start to work on. Um, thin engagement can also um, encompass coordinating work by regular people. So here's an example of a, a website. I believe it's out of the Boston area, which um, basically matches people who need their, their driveways and hydrants shoveled with people who can shovel. Um, and what's really interesting about this is then people who may not be able to do either, but can bring along hot chocolate and some cookies um, and sort of participate in, and help with, with um, citizen work uh, through just volunteering in a different way. And it really builds community. Um, here's just some examples. Um, some of them I already touched upon. See, click, fix, fix by street. Um, you also have crowdsourcing ideation platforms like Idea Scale, Mind Mixer, crowdfunding like IOB, petitions, change.org. There's games um, such as Community Planet and mapping um, wikis and other online platforms. So what's really important about both thin and thick engagement is that you need to have a proactive network-based recruitment. So um, a tool that can be very helpful is mapping local community networks and really involving community leaders, those connectors in those networks. Um, it's also very important to figure out who's not at the table and who's least likely to participate and find ways of incorporating them in your engagement processes. Um, it's also important to incorporate online as well as face-to-face -face connections and be sure to follow up. At the end of the day, for us, engagement is treating people like adults. It gives people information, chance to tell their story, um, opportunities to make choices, um, processes that are legitimate, opportunities to take action, and then an overall a good process. For me, it's really important when I think of engagement processes, I think about would I want to participate if I was in the community after work? So I try and make uh, design and work with communities to design processes that are fun, that are food, that, that have food and that are inclusive and overall a good process. Any questions? Oh. Yes, yeah, so if, if, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in there. And Matt, I believe we're going to do some polls at this point. Yes, yeah, a couple more polls. And I've been uh, typing away at some of the questions uh, that people asked while, while Nicole was talking. So you'll find a couple of answers there. One was again, or actually b both were having to do with the whole question of open meeting, law meeting laws. Uh, and one of the answers I gave includes a link to another resource people might want about model ordinances. But go ahead and, and uh, let's see this, uh, this next poll. So what's, what's the biggest challenge you face in your engagement work? So we, we have some options for you. Uh, recruiting participants, is it uh, finding funding or other kinds of support? Uh, is it sustaining engagement? Um, or is it attracting support from decision makers um, and, or other? And if you, have, if you want uh, to, to give other as an answer and if you want to give us uh, what you're thinking of when it comes to other, just go ahead and type that in. Trustworthy. <laughs> so let's um, take on another question here. So city staff cite lack of time and budget constraints as barriers to performing high quality engagement. Do you have tips on ways to acquire more resources for engagement or perform better engagement work within budget and time constraints? Well, there's not too many easy answers to this, of course, um, but I think that some of the things we're going to talk about next in the webinar may be helpful. Um, and they have to do with the fact that, that engagement, one of the reasons that, that engagement is so, takes so much time and effort is because we do it on this very episodic sort of way. We do it uh, on a case-to-case -case basis rather than thinking about kind of ongoing sustained engagement that can keep bringing people to the table um, ongoing, in an ongoing way. Um, so that's, that's kind of one, one um, kind of overarching kind of answer to the question. 
A second answer, I think, is just that, um, before we get to the poll answers here, a, a second way of answering this question is that in most places, um, engagement is done on a kind of every department for itself sort of sort of basic way. And this is true of, of city departments or school systems, also is true of all kinds of other organizations in the community, nonprofits, universities, other, other groups that also do engagement, community organizing groups, they tend to all do it by themselves. They tend to not to collaborate uh, with other organizations, other groups, um, and, and um, that's a real shame in the sense that some of the most difficult uh, challenges have to do with simply bringing people to the table in the first place. Um, and if you have a, a kind of a wider array of, of leaders and organizations who are helping to do that recruitment, you are generally going to get a larger and more diverse array of people who then come to the table. So thinking about how you can be collaborating um, between these different organizations across different issue areas is certainly another way to kind of maximize the, the resources and funding you have. So challenge, uh, challenges that the people have named here, the number one, I guess, is finding funding or other support. Number two, cl a close number two is sustaining engagement. And then we have attracting support from, from decision makers, uh, recruiting participants and other. Let's go to that next, um, that next um, poll question. Um, I'm looking also at the chat here. Uh, a couple other challenges people named in the chat, and these are probably uh, other uh, types of answers. One, knowing which type of which type of engagement to do and how to do it well, and then, and then equitable engagement is another uh, another challenge somebody uh, suggested. So the second uh, question here, or I'm sorry, this is the third overall question, polling question here, is uh, what is the greatest opportunity we face in this work? Um, and and when, when, I, when we said the, in this work, I think we were thinking kind of fairly broadly in this kind of whole field of engagement. Um, what is the greatest opportunity? Uh, is it the opportunity of weaving together face-to-face -to -face and digital engagement, um, finding more ways to measure and demonstrate outcomes, uh, finding more ways to make engagement more social and sustainable, uh, learning more from engagement in other countries, or other? And again, if you want to um, type, type your your other responses that you're thinking of into the chat, we can read them out. Okay. Maybe that's long enough, Brian? Yeah, they're still filtering in, man. I'll, uh, okay. <laughs> sorry. A couple seconds, but yeah, some good answers here. Oh, one amazing international examples from one from Kimberly Bain include uh, Taiwan imagines and Singapore conversations. Hmm. Another opportunity somebody mentioned uh, it was really understanding our community. I'll go ahead and end it there and share the results here for everyone. So number one, finding more ways to make engagement social and sustainable, uh, the clear winner. <laughs> and then finding more ways to measure and demonstrate outcomes Third, weaving together face-to-face -face and online, and then the other two um, were distant in the rear. All right, so let's go back here to control the screen here. Okay, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about uh, about sustaining engagement. And so I think you know, one of the things that we are working on a lot of public agenda and uh, others are as well is this question of kind of systems of engagement. And by a system of engagement, what we're talking about here are the laws, processes, institutions, and associations that are supporting regular opportunities, activities, and arenas that allow people to connect with each other, solve problems, make decisions, and be part of a community, which is a mouthful. <laughs> Basically, these are kind of systems that are kind of the, the interconnected ways in which we are kind of providing regular opportunities for engagement to people in the community. And if you kind of want to unpack that a little bit, um, and this is something again that Tina and I uh, worked on in, in, in the book, um, we, we unpacked it by kind of describing six different building blocks. And basically, you know, if you're thinking about a healthy system of engagement in your community, these are the six types of things that you want to see happening. Uh, you want dis uh, information to be disseminated by institutions, by experts um, about various kinds of public issues and priorities. You want input uh, information, data coming back from citizens, whether it's about pothole, uh, potholes or, or health or their attitudes about things. You need to have this kind of, you know, the, that side of the information, um, you know, circulation happening as well. 
you need people to be discussing and connecting uh, on a regular basis. And this is actually the building block that I feel gets you know, most ignored in communities. They, they focus on some of the other things here and they don't think enough about kind of what the opportunities people have. And they can be very social ones uh, for people to kind of learn together, talk to get to, to each other, look at different options um, and connect over some of the things that they care about. At the top level here in these different building blocks, you've got small scale decision making and choices for individuals, for families, groups, neighborhoods. These are a lot of these kinds of thin opportunities for engagement we were talking about. Um, and then, then the larger scale decision making, you know, opportunities for people to be involved in that. And that, of course, is you know, larger questions that may affect the whole neighborhood, the whole school, the whole community. Um, and, and giving people a chance to be involved in those. And then finally, public work and recognizing the fact that people do have incredible capacities and talents, skills that they can devote to public problem solving. Uh, and you wanna have ways to support that, to encourage it, to give people awards, to help people get the information they need um, so that that, that sort of public work um, is, is encouraged. So let me just give you some, some you know, more, more concrete types of examples. And these are examples um, from all over the place and they're very different from one another. We just wanted to give you some different visions when you were trying to think about what would a system uh, of engagement actually look like. In each of these examples, what you'll see is some kind of regular opportunity where people are coming together. And that's certainly true of this one. This is Portsmouth, Portsmouth Listens, which has been happening in New Hampshire the city of Portsmouth for, for close to 20 years now. Um, basically what you've got is, is, is a kind of a thick engagement process, a deliberative process where you've got several hundred people getting together each time in the small group discussions. And what they're doing in those discussions is addressing whatever the kind of top issue or decision facing the community is at that point in, in that, that year. And this started out, uh, was actually the very first issue they focused on was, was, was bullying in the middle school and they've actually used this same type of process uh, to take on all lots of other issues uh, relating to schools, uh, planning, development, uh, budget kinds of questions, whether to build a new middle school, the renovation of the uh, all kinds of things. Hey Matt, just so you know, we're having some trouble hearing you there. Um, I don't know if your mic might be uh, covered. Sorry. There you go. Uh, is that better? Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So another another um, example is Buckhannon, West Virginia. And this is a process called a meet and eat. And basically all this is, is a regular lunch that takes place in a restaurant, Maggie's uh, Cafe in this town of Buckhannon. And basically at the lunch, they have kind of an open space um, process where you go in and there's, you pay five bucks for your meal and there's table tents on each of the tables. Uh, and you've got, uh, you know, table tents on different kinds of issues or, or things people want to talk about. There's also blank table tents so you can fill out your own and start your own table. But it's basically a way to kind of, it's an open space process for people to talk about what they want to talk about. Um, this is, um, as I said, it's a highly, highly regular thing. It happens every week. Sometimes they get five people, sometimes they get 50. Um, and out of these the conversations have emerged um, ideas and solutions to a lot of the kind of things that they wanted to do it, do as a town. So they created a park, a weekly summer music festival, uh, a farmer's market, which is pictured here, a city plan. Um, this is not something that had public officials part of it from the beginning. Uh, they, it was something that public officials began to filter in as it, as it got, as it went on, as it got, became more popular, as, as more people kind of became part of the process. And so we've got an opportunity there for people in, who have positions of authority to kind of hear from, from, from their constituents to test out different ideas on them uh, and so on. But, uh, but a key piece of this is, is also that, you know, people are not just showing up because they're gonna rub elbows with the sheriff or the county economic development director. It's just also because there's a meal involved and they're seeing their friends. So there's a kind of social incentives for people to engage. And uh, once you have those going, you, what you've got is a much more sustainable form of engagement. This is a, a, a similar sort of example at a whole different end of the scale in terms of the size of the community. This is on the table, which has been happening in Chicago for five years now. Um, that the, the, the peak of it actually, is, uh, that's, this slide is a bit out of date, that the largest uh, turnout in any of these years was actually over 105,000 participants. But it, it's, it's similar in the sense that it's, it's, it's structured around a meal. Uh, what you've got is people getting together in um, living rooms or in uh, church basements or other kinds of venues all over the city, uh, talking about issues facing the region, 
um, and uh, and also just socializing, meeting people. Um, that, that part of the process in this in this um, pro this project is that, that they've had from the beginning a kind of a, a a method for sorting people. So you end up seeing some people you already know and others that you've never met before, and that that's part of the whole process. So some of the evaluations I'm on the table suggest that people. Uh, believe that they understand public issues much better from learning about them through this process, and that many of them say that they'll take action on an idea that they discussed um, during the session. On the table right now is, is a purely annual process that happens uh, once a year. This is a very different sort of um, example. This is the town of Hoon in Spain. Uh, and the mayor of Hoon was an early uh, Twitter uh, user. And he began early on in his uh, tenure, began thinking about how he might be able to use uh, Twitter in the course of governance um, in a very productive way. This is really, a, um, this was something that kind of started up way before Twitter was even aware of it, Twitter the company, I mean. Um, and way before other kinds of uh, officials started using Twitter. Um, and basically what they did at the beginning was they, they asked people and the residents of the town to kind of va validate uh, their Twitter uh, addresses, their, their Twitter um, account names. So you would go to City Hall and say, yeah, I, I live with thus and such an address, this is my Twitter name, so you know that if you see a tweet, it's from me. They also did a whole lot of training at the very beginning to make sure that people you know, were comfortable using Twitter, were comfortable using a computer. Um, and they reached out in particular to senior citizens or other uh, people uh, that uh, groups in the, in, the, in the town they felt would be less likely to use this. And then the, the last thing they did was they simply asked people to start everyone inside City Hall and everybody outside City Hall to, to tweet and to, to handle various kinds of questions, concerns, requests through Twitter. Um, so they've got people tweeting about public safety issues or, or street sweeping or, or the budget. The mayor tweets about EU policy questions. There's all kinds of a discussion about various different levels of governance. They realized that, that this was really taking off when they, they saw that people were actually using Twitter to book doctor's appointments um, or you know, advertise the social events or, or things like that. The, uh, the street sweeper in Hoon has become a Twitter celebrity because he uh, takes before and after pictures of his work and then makes jokes about it on Twitter. Um, and so part of what happened was through this process that people uh, outside city, outside city government began to realize who was responsible for what inside city government. So if they knew that they needed a street light uh, replaced, they, they began to realize who, who the person was who was actually responsible for that. And they were able to kind of figure that out through, through this process. And then also meet people inside City Hall or inside local government were able to realize here are the, the people we, I need to talk to if I have a question or a problem in this particular street or in this, this neighborhood, things like that. So it's basically opening up kind of the silos of governance so that people can understand you know, and, and interact with people who are not just elected officials of the rank and file um, in, in City Hall. BB certainly is another example um, of sustained engagement. Um, as I said before, uh, PB has been going on in Brazilian cities for close to 30 years. Um, what you have with PB is a commitment from, from the government to adopt a budget, That's basically what, what they're doing. And this is true also in, in, in the US forms of PB now. There's a set aside fund that people can, can um, talk about and from the fund they can, and they can nominate ideas. Uh, for money to be spent on from the fund. Uh, they can then work with each other to kind of um, refine those ideas, research them, make sure that they're legal, uh, feasible, uh, figure out what things cost, work with city staff and officials. So there's these kind of thick forms of engagement that are built into PB. And then at the end of the process, there's a thin form, which is the vote. People actually then vote uh, using this fund, um, you know, how, how should, should uh, the money be spent. But again, in Brazil in particular, uh, you know, in addition to, to kind of the, the decisions being made in the process, it's something that's like these other forms of sustained engagement, it's something that's highly, been highly social. It's something that happens in the neighborhood on a regular basis. People are involved in different ways. People have, are doing it partly because they want to, you know, vote on how this money should be spent, but they also be, are involved because they want to see their friends. They want to be part of the event, all those types of things. In, in, in uh, Brazil and lots of other PB examples, certainly those in the US, there's also a strong uh, um, track record of youth engagement. Um, in many of these PB processes, you can vote on the PB, uh, the, the, you, you can take part in the PB vote uh, if you're anywhere over uh, 14 years of age or 16 years of age in some places. So they're opening it up to, to younger people and welcoming people, young people to be uh, part of the process in various ways. 
And then finally, another kind of social sustained engagement example is, is in Decatur, Georgia, which has a long track record of, of interesting forms of engagement. And one of the ones that they have done is something called budgets in a year, uh, which is basically a monthly thing where they um, have people, they invite people to come down to, to the various several different pubs, uh, restaurants that they have in their downtown. And people from, uh, from City Hall come with you know, with uh, big charts and uh, flyers, handouts on, on the budget and various budget issues. And they're able to kind of demonstrate for people, you know, here's, here's what we're facing with the budget this next year. Here are the big uh, questions. Here's the expenditures. They're able to kind of take questions and talk to people. They, they hand out little you know, surveys so people can kind of say what they think about various issues. But again, it's something where, you know, you're coming because you're interested in the topic. You want, want to know more about your local government and how people are spending money, but you're also coming because you can see other people you know, and there's beer and there's food and, and there's other reasons. To be engaged. So I hope you can see in these examples, you can see, you know, some, uh, some evidence of some of these different uh, building blocks uh, in place. People are, are coming together to discuss and connect, they're getting information, they're giving input data back, they're part of small scale and large scale decision making, um, they're part in many cases uh, of, of taking action themselves as volunteers, uh, taking on public work to, to solve problems and to act on, on priorities. Okay, so let me just move to the next slide. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, if you want um, more examples of how, uh, you know, engagement looks in various places, one resource that you to access is participedia.net, shown here on the screen. And basically, it's a, it's a um, repository um, for, um, uh, it's, a, it's basically the largest repository yet of case studies, methods, um, and organizations that are all involved in engagement. So, questions? And let me go up to the... And Nicole, please chime in if you'd like. Okay. Um, all right, so how can a government employees encourage the larger bureaucracies that they work with or in or other government entities to adopt more public engagement process practices? Um, this is certainly a challenge. I mean, and, and a couple of kind of things that, that, uh, that tend to work. One is giving people kind of real live examples like some of the ones I just shared and others you might find at Participedia or elsewhere. So give people kind of you know, real live stories of here's that perhaps are relevant to the size of the community you're talking about or the issue you're talking about. So you can kind of give them a narrative about why other people did this and what happened. And then another thing that's really helpful as far as uh, encouraging, uh, you know, other other public staff officials to do engagement well is to give them a, a direct experience, you know, to organize a sample small, small group discussion of the type you're trying to do, um, you know, get them involved in an online process and dummy it for them so that they can actually kind of experience it themselves. Uh, do a pilot group where you can have a set of people, including a few from, from this other uh, government agency um, who, who will kind of take part together in the process. Another person, I'm not, this is actually in the chat. Um, could you also outline the costs of engagement versus project initiative risks and failures? Um, so, I mean, so yeah, I mean, and this, you know, there's lots of different settings for this. So it's hard to have a single kind of answer for this, but generally, you know, you can certainly find examples of um, cost overruns, uh, decisions gone awry, you know, kind of examples where if, if there had been better engagement or more engagement, the community might have saved a whole lot of money. You know, so kind of giving people some of those kinds of disaster scenarios sometimes kind of wakes them up to uh, the need to actually do engagement in a more proactive um, sort of way. Um, the other thing that you could be talking about is the extent to which, uh, you know, engaged participants will actually help you, you know, achieve some of the things you're trying to do. Now, this, this is all right. This is certainly true of, of kind of processes or projects where you're trying to take on not just a single decision, but you're trying to take on kind of a, an overarching priority in the community, uh, you know, public safety, 
um, or um, you know, uh, economic growth or some of those kinds of things. If you can kind of show that and show stories that, that, that how, where volunteers were able to kind of achieve some impact and, and help, help, help out, uh, help government, help other people kind of tackle a problem, um, then you can kind of quantify some of the, the kind of the cost savings from those kinds of processes. Um, uh, Nicole showed the, the snow crew example from Boston. You know, one of the things that, that is good about that process is that people sign up to shovel out fire hydrants. So that the fire department in Boston is very happy to have snow crew because not only are people helping each other, uh, you know, shoveling out driveways and things like that, they're also shoveling out these public services and public, public amenities that everyone relies on for their safety. And, and that's the kind of thing also you can, you probably can, can uh, kind of quantify some of the, the uh, cost savings. So let's see here. Another person is, how do we, uh, is there evidence that the 30 years of PB in Brazil has changed the political landscape in any noticeable way? Do you have advice on how to de-silo government departments and encourage collaboration from a policy perspective or examples of cities that have had success? Okay, there's three big questions there. <laughs> um, and I think that, and, and on the first question about 30 years of PB in Brazil, I think I'd refer you to the work of Brian Wampler and, and Mike Touchton um, and the work of, of um, uh, Daniel Sugarensky, a number of people who have written a lot about PB and have kind of brought together research uh, on PB. In addition, you can, um, for the North American, this question is about Brazil, but for the North American uh, PB research, there's a number of resources on the public agenda side. Public agenda has for a while been coordinating the North American Research Board for PB. And so you can find on the public agenda website several different white papers and reports on the progress and things that have been learned from PB in North America. Uh, how do we convince uh, our top local government administrators to allow and appreciate public agenda and not see it as asking what citizens want carte blanche. They seem to think it's setting staff up for expectations to fix everything just by talking about our community's future. Yes, that's an excellent point. This definitely is a common concern by elected officials and others is that, you know, by asking people what they want, they're basically raising their expectations and the public officials will be blamed uh, when they can't meet those expectations. This is, you know, a matter of, of both framing and process, you know, framing and engagement in terms of kind of welcoming people to kind of be part of the solution as well as being part of talking about the problem. So that the, from the very beginning in engagement, you should be figuring out ways that you're going to ask people not just to make recommendations, but to figure out what they can do to actually help implement some of those things to help solve some of those problems. And you want to kind of support those efforts wherever you can. So it's, it's part of the the, kind of the way you're talking about engagement, and then it's also um, kind of actually making that real in the process. So the, the process is intensive enough, and usually this means enough thick engagement opportunities to go along with the thin ones that people can actually kind of get together, meet people that they may not have worked with before, and actually kind of take on some of the issues and, and problems that they want, to, uh, issues or ideas that they want. To. So. Uh, Nicole, do you see others here that we haven't, there are a lot here and we want to encourage you all to keep contacting us after this webinar um, because we're happy to, we can deal with some of these um, better if we understand kind of where the better kind of where the question is coming from um, and where, um, uh, you know, what, what the context is. But do you see others here, Nicole, that, that uh, you want to jump in on? Hi, Matt. But yeah, there was one question about that we missed in the beginning, and it was about asking us to elaborate a little bit more on why um, donating money is a form of engagement. So maybe you could you could chime in on that answer. <laughs> well, I, uh, I mean, I, it sounds like someone might want to bring <laughs> is starting trying to start a campaign finance uh, this good debate here. But I mean, I think um, you know donating, you know. Uh, especially with as one of the kind of thin forms of engagement that have kind of emerged over the last, you know, uh, 10, 20 years or so. I mean, people giving often very small increments of money to uh, various causes that they that they support. You know, you've got Kickstarter, you've got Crowd Investor, other uh, Citizen Investor, other types of platforms like that. 
Um, IOB is another one where people can be donating not only their, their money to something that they care about, but also uh, figuring out what kinds of volunteer uh, contributions that they can make, and in some cases, kind of uh, coordinating those kinds of efforts. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just money, it can be money and that also then encourages people to kind of con make other kinds of contributions. Thanks, Matt. Right. Matt, I think uh, because we're running on time here, yeah. yep. you know, uh, we, we, uh, we still have a good amount of people that stuck with us. And as a reward now, well, we're, we're going to run a <laughs> poll. Um, and you get to tell us uh, what you'd like to see next in a, in a future webinar. So we're going to go ahead and run that right now. It is multiple choice, so feel free to select whichever ones you like. Um, but if you see a favorite, select that one. And there you go. And also, I mean, we, we, we just kind of brainstormed these four that you see here, and, and most of them are based on work that we're doing, um, you know, and, and other things where we have some, some, some things that we can share on these topics. But um, feel free to also, you know, email us with other, other topics that you'd like to see or, or ones that you might want to collaborate on. And that's a good segue there, man. I'm going to go ahead and show you contact info here so now everybody knows how to contact you. Here's Nicole's first. Everybody, uh, and again, we'll be providing a, a recording of the webinar as well and a, a, a PDF of all the slides. So if you miss any of this information, don't worry, you'll, you'll have it in an email in the next few days. So there's Nicole's information. Be sure to follow us all on Twitter as well. And then there is Matt's information. And then Matt, as people are still, uh, you know, as we're tailing the votes here, you wanted to maybe uh, say a quick thing about the, the book here. Oh, sure. So I mentioned this book a couple of times. Some of the things, some of the, the, um, the content we were talking about here comes from the book. Um, so the, you've got a couple of URLs you can look at here and there's actually lots of free stuff. I mean, obviously you had to pay for the book itself, but, but uh, there's certainly lots of free stuff, slide, um, slide decks and a whole participation skills module to readings that you can actually find on the Wiley site. If you, if you go to the bit.ly link there, the CD resources link, uh, you'll see those kinds of um, uh, resources. And it looks like the, the, the clear winner here is finding new ways of testing for impact, ideas and tools for measuring engagement. Um, and, and with that being said, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we are gonna be doing a webinar series this fall. So we will send more information about that in the follow-up email uh, to the webinar. Uh, in addition to the recording of the webinar, a link to the recording of the webinar, and uh, a, a uh, copy of the slide deck in PDF form for everyone. Um, also, uh, this content, you could find this also in some of the uh, in-person workshops that Matt and Nicole do uh, across the country. We have two of them coming up this fall. Uh, I believe the next one is in Toronto uh, this September. September 24th. There you go, September 24th. Matt's very excited about that one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we'll send more information about that, how you could sign up for it. Uh, and we'll also be in Silver Spring, Maryland, October with the 23rd. Day, 23rd. Uh, <laughs> and we'll send more information about that as well, uh, how to register, uh, all sorts of info. Um, and as Matt said, you know, again, feel free to uh, email, uh, email us. Make sure you follow us on social media. You see all of our, our latest PE uh, work that we're doing. Uh, in addition to the other work that Public Agenda has. Um, so thank you to Matt and Nicole uh, for, for doing this presentation and thank you to everyone for, for joining us. We, we look forward to uh, talking with you in the future and hearing your comments. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody.